isn't it, that when we come to Bible class, we, we, we come and we listen to a reading like that. But we're not just particularly interested in, in hearing a, a famous story retold. We are, we are coming to ask ourselves, well, why, of all the things that could have been recorded, is that particular incident um, put in? There must have been lots of colourful incidents between Saul, Jonathan, and so on. And so we're looking behind the, or underneath the text to find out what is the Bible trying to tell us here. And I concluded, looking at it really, that the lesson that we find from it is to learn a lot about the effective exercise of spiritual authority. You see, David um, was a brilliant leader and, and he seemed to learn how to be a leader by looking at Saul and seeing how not to be a leader. So that's what he took from Saul. And we all are, in some way or another, we all are spiritual leaders in our lives, whether it's in the ecclesia, whether it's at home. Um, we all want also to be effective spiritual leaders in God's coming kingdom. So that's the, the line I've taken to look at this negative chapter as it certainly is. Now it must be significant, and it surprised me, that of all the biblical characters that I mentioned, Saul, of Ki uh, son of Kish, is actually the fifth most mentioned person in the Bible. That is quite astonishing. Uh, most of the references to Saul are clustered around uh, the, the book of Samuel. But he, if you have a list in order of most mentioned characters, then first of all Jesus, then David, then Moses, then Jacob, and then Saul, son of Kish. And below that you have Aaron, Abraham, Solomon, Joseph and Paul. So that is quite amazing. And it must be because Saul embodies the thinking of the natural, unenlightened mind. The mind that we all share in, the Bible sometimes calls it the flesh. Saul is a kind of leader that seems to make his way up uh, through the ranks, doesn't he, in, in history. He's the kind of leader that lots of people quite literally look up to. He's tall, he looks impressive, he, he makes decisions, he barks out orders, uh, he's decisive, um, and, and when he makes mistakes he's quite unrepentant. He doesn't take U-turns, he doesn't get bogged down with listening to what other people, or even God, is trying to tell him and he ignores issues that he can't cope with. Now, I'm aware that I'm now retracking a little bit on what Peter Hill covered, because in order to understand this incident we have before us, it's just necessary to briefly recap on what preceded it. And so, to understand this chapter, let's go back to the first part of the chapter, it's 1 Samuel 14, verse 1. Most of my quotations are taken from this uh, 1 Samuel 14, so you will need to keep your finger in there. And I'm using the New American Standard Bible for, for the version I'm using. So here, in 1 Samuel 14, verse 1, we have got Jonathan taking the initiative to attack the Philistine garrison at Michmash. And it's just a few miles away from where Saul and his army are camped. And Saul is brooding underneath a, a pomegranate tree surrounded by 600 men and the priest Abijah. His army is ill-equipped, the men's morale is low, the Philistines are strengthening their grip on the land, and Saul has reached a stalemate. He's aware that people are looking to him to solve a problem that he doesn't know what to do um, about uh, and he is thinking of himself very much in terms of being a conventional king, and he's thinking in terms of a conventional battle, perhaps with God in reserve to call upon if things go wrong. That's how Saul sees it, and that's why he's in a point of stalemate. Whereas Jonathan, the other character who, who runs through this narrative, sees the situation through what we call the eye of faith. Uh, in the words of Elisha to his servant, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So Jonathan then, perceiving that, is more effective. He's a leader of just one man. And yet, because that man is a faithful accomplice, 
that one man is more effective than 600 troops of the conventional kind. Now Saul, uh, Jonathan, when we look at him, his relationship to Saul, he's very much the loyal son, the loyal subject, and yet he doesn't ask his father for permission to take this initiative. And we might wonder why not, but it's almost certain when we look retrospectively about what happened, that Jonathan knows that Saul would not give him permission to do this. Saul wants to be the decision maker here, and he would veto any initiative. Because as far as Saul is concerned, he, he wants the glory to come to him. Whereas in the case of Jonathan, he wants the glory to go to God and the victory to be for Israel. He doesn't see it in personal terms. And it works out like that, as the end of verse 23 tells us, after this daring commando raid that Peter Hill told us about. So the Lord delivered Israel that day. Jonathan has not been reckless. He, his words are, perhaps the Lord will work for us. That's in verse 6. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or few. <laughs> But Saul, as we take up our present passage, is not happy about this turn of events. It may be that he's got some resentment, perhaps, about Jonathan. He is jealous of that initiative, and he starts to see it as insubordination. But he does get drawn in to chasing the Philistines. And as he does so, we notice that he quickly makes an attempt to refocus the attention of his troops on his own personal role as their leader. They are now going to feel the weight of his presence. Verse 24. Now the men of Israel were hard pressed on that day, for Saul had put the people under oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening, until I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. And we notice this emphasis of I and me. And it occurs right the way through the very detailed story of Saul that we get in the scriptures. And you do meet people, people who are leaders who are like this, who want to be the decision makers, but it's all about them. That they aren't team players. It's interesting in verse 24, the English Standard Version, rather unusually but accurately, translates here, verse 24, it translates as this. The men of Israel had been hard pressed that day, so Saul laid an oath on them. It's almost as though he sees them struggling, and so he does it. And we might wonder, well, why did he place this oath upon them? Well, obviously the Philistines were running away, and Saul did not want to lose time. He personally had got energy for the chase. But some of his men were struggling. And Saul, at this point, would have done well to ask God for guidance. There was a priest there, and there was an, a, an ephod. I remember Julia's grandfather always used to say, a man who is too busy to pray is too busy. And Saul was too busy. And in addition to that, he links this command with an oath. And that is serious, because... What is happening is that he is posing as if it's some kind of religious zeal. He's linking God and his command, and he is blurring boundaries between his own willfulness and the will of God. That was not the will of God, but he's, God is brought into this. As any general knows, an army marches on its belly. We also notice in passing that Saul was very quick to make rash oaths. There's quite a few in this chapter, and um, it, there are a lot of scriptural warnings about doing that. And the problem that Saul had is self-importance. It is, no doubt, the most subtle and the strongest foe that we face, and it does sometimes masquerade as a spiritual quality. It dresses itself up as zeal. In his reckless haste, Saul had not left room for God. And yet, God had provided in advance a supply of ready energy 
in the most unexpected way for his people's needs. Verse 25. When the people entered the forest, behold, there was a flow of honey, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared Saul's oath. So here was Israel, as Moses had promised it would be, literally a land flowing with honey. The people can see it, but thanks to one man's willfulness, they cannot benefit. And again, we can't help standing aside from the situation here, because we remember that these people had asked God, please can we have a king like the nations round us? And Samuel had said, behold the king you have chosen. And here he was now, as <coughs> impulsive, self-willed and over-legislative as any of the kings in the nations around them. And now, onto the scene, enters Jonathan, who doesn't know about the oath. No doubt because he's been tied up with more important matters. And he follows his common sense. He tastes the honey and immediately his eyes are, as the AV says, enlightened. And in this, in his eyes being enlightened, we have a direct link with two psalms, which if we put them together are surely looking back to this occasion. Psalm 119, if you keep your fingers in the other chapter. Psalm 119, verse 103. And from there we're going to go to Psalm 19. So you may wish to find that also, <laughs> if you've got enough fingers. <clears throat> Well-known words to us. Psalm 119, verse 103. How sweet are your words to my mouth. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Then Psalm 19, verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord, Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So here we have this link of God's commandments, God's word and enlightenment of the eyes. Now back to Samuel, to verse 29, for Jonathan's analysis of what has happened with his father's rash decision. Again, we say Jonathan was a loyal person. He, he craved to be loyal to his own father, and yet he had to be honest. Then Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if only the people had eaten freely today. They could have taken the honey and then they could have gone up to eat the spoil of the Philistines. There was food in plenty for them. But sadly, as now Jonathan points out, now the slaughter of the Philistines has not been great. Jesus later said to the Pharisees in Mark 7, you nullify the word of God by your tradition. He told the lawyers in Luke 11, you weigh down men with burdens hard to bear. Isaiah said to his generation, the word of God to them will become do and do, do and do again, rule on rule, rule on rule a little here, a little there, so that they will go and fall backwards and be injured. And this was the spirit behind Saul and his ruling. Verse 31, back with the Israelites. They struck amongst the Philistines that day from Michmash to Aijalon, and the people were very weary. And, well, they might be, because if you look it up on, on, on the map, you'll find that with all the travelling around they did at that time, they travelled well over 20 miles, and they had to follow the Philistines right over the mountains, rugged terrain, until they came to the Philistine plain, well over 20 miles. Now, every human has a breaking point, and Saul's men are pushed well beyond that line. 
it is evening and therefore it's a new day and therefore they are actually technically freed up from the oak. But unfortunately they are too hungry to follow the cor correct requirements of the law regarding meat eating. Verse 32. The people rushed greedily on the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people ate them with blood. And so we learn that if people are denied legitimate channels for their spiritual well-being, then some will be driven to be eating forbidden food. We all know from Leviticus, it's in Leviticus 17 and 22, that the life of the animal is in the blood, and that the law of Moses required them to drain the blood from the carcass. It's what Jews still do to this day. Now Saul doesn't seem to have noticed this breach of the law at first. Perhaps he wasn't even bothered. But it is pointed out to him by some of his men who do care, and then he cannot ignore it. Verse 33. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. And he said, You have acted treacherously. Roll a great stone to me today. And here once again we see Saul rushing in to the action, trying to correct a disaster which he actually has provoked. And we notice that he is quick to accuse his men of acting treacherously. He does not show sympathy for their plight. And unlike Moses or David, when he sees his people sinning, there's no suggestion that he's going to try and intercede on their behalf. Verse 34, Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, Each one of you bring his ox or his sheep and slaughter it here and eat. And do not sin against the Lord by eating with the blood. And Saul, of course, was quite right to do this and better late than never. Verse 35, Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. It seems a surprising detail, doesn't it? It seems as though he does it because circumstance has driven him to do that. And when we look at the Hebrew, it, the Hebrew wording of this, it seems as though he perhaps began to build an altar. It's something that he began doing but didn't finish. It's either that or he started or restarted altar worship. It seems then as though altar building had lapsed since the time of Samuel. Saul was as forgetful as he was impatient. And so much for his attempt at haste. The enemy has now escaped. And again we see Saul making a dash to save time. Verse 36. Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and take a spoil among them until morning light. And let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. So the priest said, Let us draw near to God here. It was not wise of Saul. The Philistines by now would be dispersed and it was now dark. They were <coughs> virtually impossible to find. But the people are long-suffering and they dare not disagree with him. Saul is going to do what seems good to him anyway. Good leaders inspire loyalty. And we compare these troops and their unenthusiastic response, with the response of Jonathan's armour-bearer bearer, in ver verse 7 of the same chapter. This is what Saul's armour-bearer, Jonathan's armour-bearer, said to him. Verse 7. And his armour-bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself, and here I am with you, according to your desire. The difference between father and son here is that Jonathan asked for guidance from God. Now, 
we find the priest suggesting, no doubt very tactfully, that Saul should do the same. And he agrees to do it. Verse 37. Saul inquired of God, Shall I now go after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But God did not answer him on that day. To not answer him on that day sounds as though a lot of time passed and Saul was stopped in his tracks. In fact, Saul is here being humbled by God in front of the people. And there is a warning here for us that God might choose to ignore our prayer if we ignore God. Can we please look at Proverbs chapter 1 to establish that idea? Proverbs 1 is, as we all know, wisdom personified. Proverbs 1, verse 24. And here we have wisdom talking to the one who ignored her. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. Verse 28. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And I'm sure we all want the positive side of that. Verse 33. But he who listens to me shall live securely and be at ease from the dread of evil. So the simple advice to us is always... Ask God and always listen to what God's word is telling us. And we can be at ease from the dread of evil. But there has not been an answer from God. And Saul assumes that the blame must surely then lie in somebody else, not himself. Verse 38, Saul said, Draw near, all you chiefs of the people, and investigate and see how this sin has happened today. Someone must have sinned, and it can't be him. Perhaps it has been the sin of eating the meat with the blood in it, in which case the people are guilty. Or perhaps it was Jonathan, and his, perhaps it was Jonathan's fault. It's very likely that by now, somebody has informed Saul of Jonathan's inadvertent breach of the oath. And this seems to be dawning upon Saul because, as it says in verse 39, As the Lord lives, though it is in, my son, in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But not one of the people answered him. Now Saul's jealousy of Jonathan is clearly starting to smoulder. He has lost the goodwill <coughs> and the confidence, and even the compliance of his troops. To say, as the Lord lives, who delivers Israel, and then make a, an oath like that, is another rash oath. And it is totally unnecessary. Here we have Saul playing at God, and using words that rather relate to the forbidden fruit in Eden. You shall surely die, Jonathan. And it's because Jonathan has eaten what he shouldn't have. Now Saul has got no need and he has no right to pass a death sentence on someone who has not knowingly sinned. He has unknowingly sinned. In any case, when we look at what Saul said in the first place, he didn't pronounce a death sentence for eating. He just said, curse is the man. And there is still a way out, which is well within Saul's capability of sorting out. Saul must know the law of God at this point, because Samuel would have carefully instructed him in it as preparation for kingship and as follow-up of kingship. And the law made a merciful provision 
for people who had unknowingly made oaths and then failed to keep them. If you keep your finger in that chapter and then head to Leviticus chapter 5, you'll find uh, this point is made clear. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 4 to 6. person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good in whatever matter and it is hidden from him and he comes to know it he will be guilty in one of these verse 5 so shall it be when he becomes guilty in one of these that he shall confess that he has sinned he shall also bring his guilt offering to the Lord for his sin and it would be a ram taken from the flock, which had no defect. So there was a remedy. Now such a provision would more than have covered for Jonathan and what he did. The fact is, of course, that it really should have been Saul who, had, after all, he had made the rash oath, and he should have been the one who made the offering. In actual fact, to our surprise, we find that Saul will have none of this at all. He is not going to back down, even if it costs him his own son. And there is an irony in this, because in the next chapter, chapter 15, we will come across Saul showing unauthorised leniency towards Agag, king of the Amalekites, an evil character who is under life sentence from God. And so here we clearly see Saul's jealousy. His obsession with his own self-importance is starting to make him see loyal men as rebels. It's Jonathan now, as we go through the story of Saul, David becomes uh, seen as a rebel, and yet David was the man who, who longed to serve his king. Verse 44, another rash vow. May God do this to me, and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. Now when a man made a vow, he would kill the animal, and he would regard his life as being like that of the animal, if he failed to keep the oath that he made when he was offering <coughs> uh, an animal. Hence, may God do more to this if I fail. In other words, Lord, cut me up and burn me if I do not keep my vow. What a stupid thing he was bringing himself to say. And it is now obvious to everybody there. He has forced the people who wanted to be loyal to him to the brink of mutiny. Verse 45. But the people said to Saul, Must Jonathan die, who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? <coughs> Far from it. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. <coughs> so the people rescued God, sorry, Jonathan, and he didn't die. <clears throat> for all Saul's efforts, it's obvious that the people see Jonathan as the hero, and now they're starting to see Saul as the villain. This is brought out in the ESV again, which in the last line of verse 45, in place of the word rescued, it said, the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. In other words, they weren't merely rescuing him, they were actually offering the sacrifice that delivered Jonathan from this foolish edict. And we might ask ourselves, why would not Saul at this point have done it? And we have to say what we all sometimes know to be true. That sometimes through pride, we can get ourselves into a really foolish situation. And we need other people to rescue us from it. And that's what happened with Saul. The people basically rescued Saul as much as they rescued Jonathan from a foolish decision taken by pride. <coughs> 
Verse 46. Then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. No doubt they were regrouping, and certainly they would return later on in greater numbers. Now before we comment on this further, I'd like to just go a bit further into the chapter. Uh, it's not covered by any other talks, and there's <clears throat> some significant things we do need to put to give Saul the credit that he did deserve. Verse 47. Now Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel. He fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, the sons of Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobar, and the Philistines. Wherever, wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. Verse 48. He acted valiantly and defeated the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. <coughs> so Saul successfully dealt with intrusive enemies, and they were a threat to Israel. And as we look at them on a map, we find that they're located to the north, the south, the east, and the west. These nations were all very concerned to see Israel uniting itself, which they did at this time, under a monarch. And Saul was doing his best to in prevent future incursions from these people. Verse 48 uses the word valiant about Saul. He was valiant, and that's fair credit. He was a brave man. Verse 52 completes the summary. Now, the war against the Philistines was severe. All the days of Saul, when Saul saw any mighty or valiant man, he attached him to his staff. So we see Saul starting a process of centralisation, which David and Solomon would take further. He is forming a permanent army. He begins to put together a, a, a bureaucracy. <coughs> Leadership is being transferred from the elders of the land, as it had been before the tribal elders, and it's now being centralised. And you have conscription, taxation all these things, the sign of a nation which is in human terms at least, becoming strong Saul didn't worship idols and he wouldn't allow witchcraft, but as Samuel told him re rebellion is as bad as those sins uh, God, as we look did work with Saul when Saul let him, and sometimes God worked with Saul even when Saul was not really letting him. We can imagine that Saul, imagine that because God was working through him, then that validated all of his methods and it was an endorsement of all he did. But that wasn't the case. God had chosen him and God did use him. Such a summary rather masks the fact that later on, as we read through Samuel, we will find Saul turning the country upside down in his jealous pursuit of David. And <clears throat> even at that time, the Philistines are starting to venture back into his territory. Also that Saul murdered almost the entire priestly family at Nob in a fit of rage. And we, we have to conclude that Saul had completely lost the plot. So how then did Saul get into that impasse? And why does the Bible record it for us. The problem was that Saul was completely overcome by a different enemy, a far more deadly enemy than Zobar, Ammon, Edom or the Philistines, north, south, east and west geographical points. It was the enemy within which overpowered Saul and he was possessed with this idea of becoming self-important even if it meant robbing God of his glory. So, just in conclusion, and I may be going into somebody else's territory, but I prefer to be a bit positive, I'd just like to refer to an event of David's life when he was in a similar, if not worse, situation than this. Interestingly enough, he had 600 men with him at the time. We won't look it up because it's something which is no doubt going to be dealt with later. But it's the situation when David is returning back to Ziklag 
the, his hometown uh, after being sent back by the Philistines. And he comes back to find that his, his, the wives and family of himself and all of his men have been taken by the Amalekites. It must have been one of the worst times in the history of David. And David is in a position where the men are starting to mutiny. So, similar situation to Saul. Interestingly, at the same time as this, David had 600 men with him too. So, what did he do with them? And the first thing that we will notice when we look at that incident is that David put it into the hands of God. Now, that must have took some real courage, mustn't it? Imagine if God had said, no, but if the Amalekites were murderous. It was a matter of, if we don't get there soon, then our, our wives and family, they'll be lost forever. And yet David, at this point, you can hear the tension in the air. What would happen if God said no? But the answer is, God said, pursue them. And then we come to the point where quite a few of David's men are exhausted. And surely the numbers here count for a lot. 600 men, every man counts. And yet when we, when we look at that record, we will find that 200 of them said, we, we just can't go any, any further forward. And so what David did was to lead those people by a brook. And there, you can imagine, as the others went and fought and retrieved, the wives, the family, the plunder. These 200 men were so exhausted, they would have splashed around, no doubt, in the water, drank from the water, and they would have thanked God that they had a leader who understood their needs and who valued them. And when David brought everybody together, he made it a rule in Israel that they would all share, uh, share and share alike, and that the person who looked after the baggage, which after all was a very important thing, his back had been turned at Ziklag, and people had come in, so those people were doing a job but they were too exhausted to follow. And David shows us the way of good leadership. In conclusion, looking at Saul, we have to accept that there are sometimes more fundamental principles than the ones we sometimes get ourselves entrenched in. The defining criteria is to find out what God's will is by prayer, by a very careful, prayerful reading of the scriptures, by listening carefully to what people are trying to tell us, and by examining our own motives. And sometimes in a conflict, that can be a two-edged sword that cuts both ways in conflict that can arise between people. Sometimes it is better to step down from a matter and leave space for God to act. As Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So then, let's learn the lessons from Saul's mistakes, because that's how David became such a good leader as he was. And then, in whatever capacity we operate as spiritual leaders, we will not be dysfunctional in the way that Saul was, but we will be highly effective leaders for the Gospel. Thank you very much.